Greetings everyone. And welcome to the AI World Summit 2020, organized by MyFinB Group. We'd like to thank you for attending this session today entitled AI Ready Bangladesh brought to you by Movementum Consultancy and Facilitation Group AMCFG. The main context for this session is in its national strategy paper for artificial intelligence, AI released earlier this year, Bangladesh has identified six strategic pillars in order to establish a sustainable AI ecosystem in the country. How far has the country achieved since then? What have been the challenges or hurdles? What are its short-term successes and opportunities that have been achieved? What partnerships should exist to accelerate the partnership? Do join us for this insightful presentation on the latest for Bangladesh AI transformation plans for 2021 and beyond. We are deeply honored today to have our panel discussion from Bangladesh, moderated by Maimunur Rashid Mustafa, who is also based in Bangladesh. Our esteemed panelists comprise of Bijan Islam, co-founder and CEO, Light Castle Partners Limited. Khan Mohammed Sakifal Alam, Analytics Advisor of Intelligent Machines Limited, Program Manager, Trust and Safety of TikTok, Commonwealth Scholar of National University Singapore, Country Director of Women in Big Data, Advisory Board Member of Global Chamber DACA, Community Leaders of AWS User Group Bangladesh who is Farzana Afrintisha, Tawida Rashid, Managing Editor of ICE Business Times, Managing Editor of ICE Today. Topu Muaj, Senior Vice President Technology of Shuhoz, Director of Secure Link Services Limited. Without much further ado, I leave the digital stage to the moderator and panelist of this track to continue the session. Over to you, Maimunur Rashid Mustafa. And enjoy this wonderful session. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh... Mr. Maimun, uh, before you start, I just want to welcome our Bangladeshi friends and partners uh, to the audience. I know you're the moderator, you're the chairperson of the session, but I just want to give a welcoming hello and a warm hello to all our friends in, in Bangladesh. Right. So uh, thank you for agreeing uh, to be part of this uh, exciting event. Uh, thank you for spending your time and thank you for connecting and piecing up together a panel of distinguished uh, speakers who are actually contributing to this cause. So we, we look forward to your vision uh, for AI Ready Bangladesh and we want to hear about your achievements, your milestones and your vision for the future. We in Singapore, Malaysia and various other countries are looking forward to your partnership with us after this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nasri. It's always uh, amazing to hear your encouraging and fresh thoughts. And uh, I'd like to uh, give a very warm welcome and assalamu alaikum uh, from Bangladesh to all of our friends from all over the whole world, uh, especially in the Southeast. And uh, I think it's important to know about Bangladesh. And I think that starts with uh, our national uh, animal, that is the tiger. So I would say that Bangladesh is a crouching tiger. We know about the uh, tigers uh, of Asia but I think Bangladesh has slowly crept up to be a tiger that is going to pounce and be the next uh, one to watch. It's not just us saying it, it's Goldman Sachs. It's one of the uh, next 11 to look out for. And when you have a country that has more than 8% growth rate systematically, and even keeps 6.2 during a pandemic, you know that we are trying to do something right. There is a formula that's going well. And one of those formulas have actually been digital Bangladesh. Our government, with uh, the foresight of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, has had this policy, uh, you know, almost uh, a decade back, that we wanted to be a forerunner and achieve technological success and be a power, uh, you know, force in the whole world. So I'd just like to tell you a few things about the country or where we want to go. So we have right now 80% fiber connectivity in the more than 144 square kilometers we have. We are a country of more than 163 million people of which 160 million plus have mobile phone connectivity. That's amazing penetration. We have 30 million active users in social media and 94 million plus total um, internet 
subscribers. So if this doesn't set the right way for digital, I don't know what does, right? So what we have uh, to understand more is that our, uh, our export earnings from the IT sector has risen from just 26 million in 2008 to a billion in 2018 to 19. And right now, it's a very different story for the world. We are investing in 16 high-tech parks, seven technology parks, 12 IT training and incubation centers, and tier four data centers. And we also have our own satellite, the Bongo and the One. Now, apart from a lot of other amazing tax incentives, what Bangladesh did was it had its own AI policy, and which is why I think today's topic is so pertinent to us, that we are AI ready, because we've already put it into our seventh five-year plan. The vision of first 2021, when Bangladesh becomes 50 years old, and in its silver jubilee, Bangladesh hopes to become, within the next decade, a totally technologically ready nation that can be in the top 30 in the whole world. Now, we hope, and our Prime Minister has stated, that by 2023, we will have 5G available. And this will allow the technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, blockchain, and IoT to be widespread. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I can go about the theories and, you know, the extensive paper, but let me just tell you the six main pillars on which we've made our AI paper. And our panelists today, who are not only homegrown, but have international reach and have, you know, have the exposure to tell you how Bangladesh has the youth, the enthusiasm and the expertise, most of all, to go forward. So the strategy that we've outlined is number one, to focus on research and development. Secondly, we'll try to look into skilling and reskilling the AI workforce to make them adaptable for the 4IR. Third, we look at data and data infrastructure and how to improve this. Then you will look at ethics, data privacy, security, and regulations, because we want to be transparent too, and we want to ensure security for everyone. Fifth, we will look at the funding and accelerating of all AI startups. And finally, we'll look at the industrialization of AI technologies. As you will see as, and as we go along this panel today, that all of our five speakers have some depth of knowledge and input and extensive intrinsic idea that they can put into this. So I'm not going to let me go on a rant. I think what you need to hear is engagements. And that's where the best discussions come from. So let's go to our first speaker for today. I'm really thankful to all of our speakers, but notably the first two, uh, because they have extruding a family and personal uh, circumstances, but they've still chosen to come here today. So first of all, I have the huge pleasure in welcoming Mr. Bijon Islam, who is the co-founder and CEO of Lightcastle Partners. And Lightcastle actually focuses on data-driven opportunities for development partners, corporates, SMEs, and startups. So we get this very multicultural view from Mr. Islam. And then they've also worked with 400 plus SMEs and startups and 30 accelerator programs in multiple industries, including technology, agriculture, health, energy, and manufacturing. Now, Mr. Islam has also experience of being in the banking sector as he has worked with Citibank NA. And in 2015, he was nominated as one of the 15 under 35 in Bangladesh by Future Startup, a leading startup media company in Bangladesh. I'd just like to have a small discussion with Mr. Islam right now. And we'll try to see from his experience in incubation, um, his, especially I think which is pertinent to funding and accelerating of AI startups our goal number five, um, where Bangladesh stands and how we can uh, become better. Uh, Bijan Sam, welcome to the panel. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the you know, very humble introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, can you repeat the question, please, that you want to understand what is the situation of AI startups in Bangladesh right now? I think what I'll say is a bit more specific. So how, what do you think what are the new companies or the startups of the SMEs? How are they preparing for the digital transformation that is being uh, you know, accelerated or that has to be integrated with artificial intelligence? 
I think the startups in Bangladesh, it's, it's fairly new. It's five to seven years old. I think it started back in 2013. If you look at some of the stats right now, there are close to 1,200 startups in the economy. And interestingly, they employ either directly or indirectly close to 1.5 million people, which is quite, a, quite a significant given that RMG sector, which is the largest export contributor for Bangladesh, employs close to 4 million people. I think in seven years, uh, this employment that has been created has you know, helped the economy uh, you know, on a sustained growth. Over the last uh, five to seven years, startups has raised close to 300 million in foreign international funding as well. <clears throat> we see a lot of this international left, including you know, and financial, sector capital, uh, large um, logistics companies like Gojek investing in Bangladesh. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the, uh, with the kind of the demographic bulge that we have, the density dividend that we have, like, you know, 1,400 people per square kilometer, uh, you know, 50% under the age of 35, the penetration that you just mentioned. But a lot of it also has to do with how people have adopted technology. The way I, uh, way I tell people that, you know, a lot of countries are leapfrogging laptops and desktops to go into mobile devices. Some of this is a stop, step further. We're actually leapfrogging uh, banks to go into digital financial services. If you look at uh, you know, mobile financial services, they have close to, at the moment, 90 million plus uh, active market accounts, right? And you know, Pikachu, which is the largest player in the market, has uh, 45 million plus accounts. Just think of the scale. In a country of 160 million, the kind of number of accounts that they have. So I think that in terms of digital transformation, we are seeing a lot of things. A lot of this initial digitalization has been done. A lot of people are, you know, have entered the digital space. Um, you know, 40 million people have smartphones, they have Facebook accounts, they're watching YouTube, they have mobile financial services accounts and everything. But now the next step has to happen. That AI and a lot of these additional, um, you know, technologies also need to come in. For example, you have a lot of transactions that are being digitized. But can you build algorithms and technologies so that those can be used to provide digital credit and access to finance to a lot of larger population that do not have that now? We are seeing startups like ShopUp, which has been funded by Seco Capital and you know Flourish Ventures. We are we have seen uh, companies like Share by XYZ. We have seen companies like you know Share Cash. You know they are trying to do that where they are digitizing merchant information, last mile merchant information, and trying to link them up with financial institutions. But it's still it's a bit bad. So I think the digital transformation is going. It's accelerating. It's on the right track. And we just need to make sure that we incubate a lot more of these uh, AI technologies, uh, machine learning, and you know more adaptive algorithms on top of the digital penetration, digital uh, digitization that has already taken place. At the same time, I think one of the things that always comes uh, you know big on the radar is the digital divide. Even though there is a large amount of penetration, I think still the quality of the internet penetration, the digital penetration is not the same everywhere. Is there is still a lot of uh, you know internet connectivity and everything is really good at city centers, but the more you know rural you go, more peri-urban you go, there is demand for it. You know people are still doing e-commerce, people are still doing you know digital transactions. But I think the digital divide, the digital infrastructure also needs to get updated as well. So that we make sure that you know truly everyone can uh, become part of the digital economy and if everyone can access uh, digital services and products through their digital devices. So I'll stop there. And I'd love to hear from the rest of our panelists here as well. Thank you. Sure. But I, th I think you, you've given us so much uh, insight that I'll just have to pop in one more question, if you'll allow me. Uh, it's very pertinent to this. So when we talk about, you know, I mean, you're, you're involved with a lot of inc incubators and, and a lot of startups. And uh, I know that you are on the boards of uh, on, on a lot of these uh, accelerators. Do you think we have the adequate funding or the you know, uh, systems in place to incorporate AI into these new generation of startups? Uh, I think access to funding is still quite new in Bangladesh. If I just draw a comparison in terms of the quality of the ecosystem, uh, according to the global, you know, uh, startup genome report, Bangladesh is ranked 98, where, you know, India is ranked 23. There are 720 plus venture capital firms in India. In Bangladesh, that's the number is just 25. Uh, in Indonesia, there are close to 5,000 uh, angels. In Bangladesh, the angels the number is around 200, right? And then uh, if you go into the number of accelerators incubators, India has around 220. Bangladesh has maybe around you know, 15 to 20 active accelerators at any point in time. 
I think, you know, not just in terms of funding, in terms of the ecosystem is still behind, but I think a lot of interesting things are coming. The government just launched a PDT $60 million fund uh, from the ICT ministry, Startup Bangladesh Limited, uh, the managing director, Tina Appa. So, you know, this government, you know, coming to help the ecosystem to catalyze funding. We're seeing a growing number of international investments coming, especially from large corporates like, you know, and financials, uh, Gojek, uh, you know, uh, venture capital firms like Sequoia Capital, who are looking, starting to look at Bangladesh, right? Previously, they would just come here and then one part would go to China, one part would go to India. You know, Bangladesh was not in the letter. I think that is changing, right? They they're, have started landing on Bangladesh. But uh, and I, we are seeing a local venture capital firms like IDLC, which is a, a large non-bank reputed financial institution, opened up the venture capital wing. Uh, we are seeing a lot of alternative investment companies starting up in the ecosystem as well. But I think <clears throat> funding needs to be, you know, become more mature. The industry needs to grow. We need a lot of corporate venture capital, large corporates in Bangladesh who have said, done large businesses in consumer durables, FMCG, RMG Textile, they also need to start investing in this uh, technology sector as well. Still are very early for them, but I think if this corporate venture capital things improve, if you're doing business improves, right? In terms of doing business ranking, Bangladesh is 168, India is 63, Vietnam is 70. Until we get to double digits, we cannot expect a lot of this international investor to come in, right? Means if you look at Bangladesh, we are just better than uh, countries uh, such as Afghanistan or Syria, and there are war going on with those countries, right? So we need to also improve some of those things as well if we want to the funding landscape to improve. I know PIDA is doing a lot of fantastic work. These high tech perks are coming, as we mentioned, 20 high tech perks. A lot of the infrastructure is mentioned, but I think we all need this synergistic effort to improve the, the funding system, uh, you know. So that we are on the radar, we just need to make sure that you know we are on the radar consistently and providing good opportunities for investors uh, at the moment. Again, That's I think I've talked point. a lot, <laughs> so I will just you know stop there. No, those are brilliant, um, and I, I think it it gives us uh, some key inputs that the opportunities are there. It's a huge market. Um, I think if we can integrate with uh, some of our partners from abroad. And if they can, if, as you said, if Gojek is coming in being a unicorn, I think other Southeast Asian parties and even the Western nations can start looking into uh, funding and see, you know, if they can grow the local landscape. All right, so we'll move on to our next speaker and we'd like to get a different point of view. And uh, he comes from um, a whole history of communication. He is the managing editor of two of the top uh, business and lifestyle magazines in Bangladesh, Ice Business Times and uh, Ice Today. His name is Mr. Tohidur Rashid. Now, if anything, I think uh, I've worked with Mr. Tohid for a very long time. And I think if anything is, is to uh, affirm disruption, that is him. He's a doctor who went into the creative line. And um, having also written in Ice, um, I, I see that there is a lot of I think technological uh, you know, articles that come out and it discusses uh, extensively about what's going on. So to uh, Mr. Doyle, I think the first question I've got to ask you is uh, you've worked with the German Chamber of Commerce here as, as well uh, in the capacity of events, media and publication. How is uh, communication changing in Bangladesh? When you hear that an artificial intelligence can eventually come in and they can, uh, basically do graphics that took a human being, let's say 30 or 40 minutes and they can do it in five, five and they can write, it, write an article by themselves. Is that scary or is that actually something that may augment the potential? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maimon, for uh, you know, saying all those nice words about myself. I'm all flattered, but uh, in front of uh, people like Bijan Bhai or Sakir Bhai, uh, I have uh, you know, worked with both of them earlier, I'm nothing. I'm just, uh, you know, you know, I'm just uh, another, I would say, technology enthusiast who is always eager to learn. Uh, uh, now, coming back to your question, uh, how the communication landscape has changed, uh, I would say it has been changing every day because uh, the way we are adopting technology uh, in our country or in our life every day with the help of smartphone and internet penetration, as well as aided by social media, it has been incredible so far. But uh, you know, the question that comes is like whether we are uh, ready for AI. 
uh, as for our uh, you know audience like ai is uh, something which is a kind of technology uh, where uh, machines learn from experience and performs like human beings if we simply put it and uh, now if we uh, think about my field which is like uh, journalism uh, what is the impact of ai or how can ai impact uh, the field of communication and journalism uh, i think covid crisis has once again uh, uh, showed all of us that we have to be um, uh, tech savvy more than ever before and particularly for a field like journalism uh, if someone asks the question like can AI save journalism uh, then uh, the question the answer should be yes of course it can uh, let me tell you a short uh, story like back in 2014 uh, Los Angeles Times uh, released uh, uh, you know a news uh, right after like after the three minutes of, uh, uh, of an earthquake and uh, everyone was surprised uh, at, you know, like uh, the, the way or uh, at the speed of like, you know, releasing that news. What happened is one of the staffer prepared a bot, uh, they used to call it Quackbot, which used to analyze data and uh, write small reports. And that was, uh, uh, that was one of the like, you know, uh, beginning when uh, bots have started writing, but nowadays, like hundreds of thousand stories are being written by uh, bots all over the world. Like, for example, uh, Bloomberg has its Cyborg, uh, and uh, then Wall Street Journal has uh, Heliograph. Uh, a lot of other, uh, you know, news media houses they have their own uh, bots. And uh, what does these bots do? If we think, uh, why am I telling all these things? Is because uh, in our country. Now, when it comes to journalism or when it comes to uh, media communication, uh, we are still following the traditional ways. Uh, and uh, that's not bad because we are waking up to new technologies. We are learning every moment. And with uh, people like Sakib Bhai, Bijan, or Tishapu and a few other uh, panelists we have here who all are contributing in their fields in different ways, uh, we are learning about this thing. So I believe that at first we need to know what we do not know and then we can kind of like, you know, um, uh, uh, gear up to learn more. So as much we know from, uh, you know, like uh, what, why AI is important or what AI has been doing in the field of journalism, uh, so far they can, uh, you know, read and analyze a large spreadsheet of data and then they can uh, write a small report. Uh, but if it comes to like imagination, if it comes to, uh, you know, in a, a lot of cases like, you know, checking the manual accuracy, which is very much important in case of investigative journalism, the AI still has very narrow limit. It is one of the limits they have and it is uh, known worldwide because, of course, uh, there are a couple of investigative reports being uh, aided with the help of uh, like, you know, being uh, with the help of AI, but still the human interference is very important. So uh, if, if to answer your questions, whether robots are going to replace journalists, I would say uh, no. But what we need to know is like we have uh, machines coming towards us and we need to know how we can use, make sure the best use of these machines uh, so that we can reap benefit out of it. And uh, uh, for example, like as uh, you know, Lisa Gibbs from AFP once said that uh, with the help of algorithm, uh, they know uh, uh, about the news faster and they can break the news faster than the rest of the news agencies. So that is one way of using that thing. Again, if we think about uh, information overload, like, you know, we see hundreds of thousands of news every day on social media, everyone else is uh, sharing something or some sort of like, you know, we are always overburdened with communication like emails or text messages or DMs. Uh, I think AI can actually help us uh, with the, uh, in the field of relevancy, like what kind of uh, news or what kind of uh, uh, information is relevant. And that will help the media houses or communication uh, agencies uh, to pick up the right kind of thing or the time appropriate kind of information and deliver it to the right kind of audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very, very insightful. Um, if I can just further poke your mind on an issue. Um, in your position as a managing editor of one of the top lifestyle, as well as 
business magazines of Bangladesh, if not the top. Um, you're frequently coming in co contact with the creme de la creme of, you know, uh, fashion houses, of business houses, of, of, of tech brands. Now, what's the reality when you get to have these conversations? Do you think people are ready? Are they prepared to accept AI? Do they know what it really is or is it still a buzzword? Uh, to be honest, it's still a buzzword because uh, from, from a very honest point of view, like uh, particularly in the fashion industry, uh, we have been uh, trying to push people to make them understand uh, how the whole thing of like, you know, Facebook marketing works. Uh, and uh, still, unfortunately, a lot of fashion brands, they just think that they would post a picture on their fashion uh, on their Facebook page, they would boost it and uh, that is branding or that would uh, generate sales. But that's not the case because in many cases, what kind of uh, campaign they should come up with uh, or what kind of uh, dresses or what kind of styling would be necessary to you know, uh, reach out to a large uh, scale of people. Uh, I think uh, that is needed uh, to be learned by all these houses. Uh, I think in most of the cases, what we are seeing is uh, we just we just see like what kind of uh, pictures are getting more clicks or more likes. Uh, for example, uh, if we think about entertainment, we see a lot of, uh, you know, jargons are making their ways into the system, like in, into the mainstream. For example, one word, para. Uh, it is, you know, it's a, it has now made its way into uh, the official, uh, one of the uh, campaign slogan of a big financial institution. Why? Because, you know, para kaiso, but this kind of words are, you know, they have, these colloquial words have become very popular. But, uh, and in most of the cases, the houses, the business houses, or like the fashion houses, they just think that, okay, this is, uh, this is trending, so we should follow this. Uh, but I think uh, time has come and I believe that uh, this kind of summits or a government initiative, there is Light Castle, there is Sakibhai, uh, they all represent organizations which have role to play to educate the brands, to educate the organizations that do not lurk after the trends, rather, uh, you know, uh, do the campaigns or the communications in a more uh, meaningful way, in an insightful way, and for that we need data. And uh, as as I was mentioning about, uh, like you know, uh, in journalism, one of the thing is like uh, uh, every day it is generating a lot of data. So you know, sifting through those data and uh, using making the best use of those relevant data, that is where uh, AI can actually help us. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Brilliant. I think on that point, um, could we infer that if the right uh, awareness programs are done by the media, I'm, I'm sure the media is trying. My first question to you would be, A, are there other possibilities or means that the media could use to inform, uh, you know, the general consumers? It could be a business. It could be, uh, you know, a direct retail client as well about the importance of business intelligence. And can we be, can we use business intelligence to actually optimize, uh, you know, the way the, the commerce actually works in Bangladesh right now? Uh, well, to answer your question, number one, I, I must say that like uh, we have legacy media houses which have been doing wonderful jobs uh, with historical roles to play in the formation of like, you know, democracy in this country or, you know, setting up the businesses in this country. But uh, a lot of these media houses, uh, even including ours one, we, we are yet to be educated about the importance of AI ourselves. So first we need to educate ourselves. And then, as I was going to mention that one of the crisis or one of the limitations or one of the debates around AI in journalism is the issue of ethics because uh, a lot of time we have to man man maintain or ensure that, that the data that we are going to use uh, is not biased. So that's very important. And at the same time, one of the uh, uh, like, you know, criticism about AI is algorithms are written by human beings. So they can be biased. In that case, if one algorithm that is, you know, uh, analyzing a particular set of data uh, if that algorithm is biased, then uh, the you know the data analysis will be biased as well. Which is why it's very important uh, that is like the skill development in the media houses. 
and also the collaboration because the media houses uh, you know uh, they have editorial stuff as well as other like tech stuff or marketing stuff so uh, uh, francisco marconi one of the professors of columbia university of uh, you know new york uh, he has written a book uh, on newsmakers and he mentioned that uh, this is very much needed for media houses to develop collaborations and uh, between their editorial stuff as well as their tech and marketing stuff and educate all together about uh, the use of ai as well as business intelligence and yes it is totally possible to you know uh, other than just going uh, the way we are going these days like you know uh, the peer agencies they send us a press release they request us to publish it and uh, uh, many many times uh, you know for our personal relationships we publish those uh, press releases but uh, that is definitely not going to uh, cut in the future uh, so at first we ourselves will have to be educated uh, have to be made aware of the whole uh, you know paradigm shift and then with uh, right kind of content creation i think we can also contribute like the media houses can also contribute uh, in uh, raising awareness among the people and uh, how the consumers can uh, you know perceive a particular product or a communication or a campaign that's all amazing i think then a key takeaway that we can uh, uh, you know kind of look into is all these issues uh, that that are happening because of uh, data not being used properly is because of education yeah that that knowledge is not being shared right now so i think there is also scope for i guess companies like bad castle and also other companies who come from abroad and share that knowledge i mean i mean knowledge is never ending but i think uh, if we have the updated one and we can apply it in the market as mr bijon already said that i i think we can go the second step forward right and usher into the fourth industrial brilliant thank you so much so i'll i'll move on to my uh, third speaker for today and we've been talking about a lot of data data being manipulated and someone's going to be explaining to us about that and uh, this uh, young lady uh, is doing some great things out there she has a lot of different hat her name is farzana fintisha among a lot of other titles that she does have uh, the ones that her make her relevant today is one she is the country director of women in big data in bangladesh secondly she is also the head of marketing of brain station 23 which is one of the top home grown global it companies and they're dealing extensively with ai and i think she can give us our outputs from there she is also a co-founder of the one and only aws community uh, in bangladesh and along with that she has been the facilitator for google's i am remarkable program in the country uh, i'm proud to say she is with me on my advisory board in global chamber dhaka and what we get asked from you tisha i think you have something to talk about big data what is the role of of big data especially for women and e even as a general like how is it penetrating i mean give us a little bit of insight yeah thank you so much maimun that was really uh, very like you know a wonderful introduction of mine but uh, i think uh, having vijan bhai and sakib bhai and uh, you know tohit bhai and uh, then uh, tohu bhai in the in the panel i would think that i'm i'm not that knowledgeable like them but i'm trying to grow and like you know learn more and more so whenever we are talking about data or big data specifically so we are actually talking about a large amount of data which is actually like you know every day we are produ producing like huge amount of data which is like around 25.2 uh, quint trillion data every day we are producing through various activities of ours especially from social media or emails or you know calls text messages etc etc so there are a lot of like you know data coming from everywhere and these data are not well structured these uh, data are not like you know um, the data we can actually use uh, straight away so we have to actually work um, to work uh, for purifying those data so that we can get the best uh, business uh, report out of it so data big data whenever we are talking about big data in general that is the case that we are thinking about a huge chunk of data uh, with which we can actually like you know um, collect those data and Uh, according to our business need we can modify them and get the right kind of result or get the right kind of uh, forecasting or prediction out of those data brilliant um i think you had a presentation ready for us uh, would you like yeah. to present that right i now? would 
I would, I would uh, surely love to. Uh, let me just uh, one minute. Yeah. Let me know if you guys can see my screen. Uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, can you full screen, uh, Miss? All right, that's better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So today I'm going to talk about like, you know, what are the challenges and what are the way forward uh, with respect to Bangladesh uh, in the uh, figure or in the prospect. So I have already like, you know, briefly uh, talk about like what is big data and what type of jet, uh, data we are generating from where. So when we can look at the like you know some statistics or data like you know um, like statista which is a german company they actually forecasted like you know the worldwide form of uh, like you know big data market from 2011 to 2026 by segment in billion of us dollars so we can see the data are used uh, by different uh, segments of the industry the professional services are using it apps and analytics uh, are using it uh, data man for data, data management, we are using data, big data. Networking, we are using big data for storage, compute, like you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a huge chunk of market out there. And if we think about the like you know, revenue worldwide, like you know, uh, from 2016 to 2027, the major segment of like you know, uh, big data that has been like you know, uh, sort of giving us revenue from for which sectors? Uh, the service sector, the software sector, and the hardware sector. So these sectors are intensively getting uh, the benefit uh, of big data. But who can get ben benefited? I, I won't say that there, there are some sort of limitation. Every sector, every uh, um, industry can utilize uh, the benefit of big data. But if we look into the like, you know, sales and marketing specifically, we can see a lot of transition has happened like, you know, over the last decade. I can see now then uh, the business uh, implications is huge. Um, and in terms of like, you know, um, business uh, outcomes or decision making. Uh, so sales and marketing are using a lot of uh, like, you know, big data analytics nowadays. And uh, now you can, you can, uh, I can give you a little bit example, like um, Toy Pai is here. Um, I, I know that nowadays, if any, if in any news portal you go and you check uh, the, a particular like, you know, campaign or a particular article of those um, a portal, you would automatically get suggestion for a relevant post that you might like to read afterwards. So how, how you can get all those like, you know, suggestions? Absolutely, there are some algorithm behind it who is actually doing the analytical work that can like, you know, suggest you according to your taste what kind of article you're looking for. So this is how, so big data is there and one of the like, you know, major technologies which are actually adding up to the big data uh, industry, uh, big data technology or platform is basically the artificial intelligence and specifically I would say machine learning. And machine, can, machine learning through um, machine learning, the computers are actually getting um, uh, a lot of information and with those lot of information they can learn and they can predict and forecast the relevant information that the business might need. So for research and development also, we can see a lot of uh, research institution and development organizations are using uh, big data or machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, to uh, build a solution or provide a solutions. Uh, supply chain is uh, getting a huge advantage. Uh, workplace management is getting a huge advantage and operation systems are getting better and better nowadays. So these are some of the like industry and you can see who are using the big data like you know extensively in which uh, particular uh, region and how how it's growing all together so the travel logistic public sector advanced industry media teleco uh, consumer retail financial services uh, Bijan Pai already mentioned that we are like you know um, adopting digital uh, finances all over the country uh, and especially in bangladesh uh, since we are sort of uh, on the verge of digital Bangladesh, and we are trying to, uh, like you know, be, become a digital Bangladesh uh, by next 2021. We are already in the in the scene, but we are trying to grow more. And uh, specifically for that, our government has taken many initiatives. 
the ICT sector is getting uh, most of the benefit of those digital Bangladesh uh, dream. So these are all the like you know uh, areas uh, that big data can aid. But where does Bangladesh stand? Uh, Maimon, I think uh, initially you mentioned that uh, 160, 1.4 million people is there, and the in internet penetration is huge. Uh, if we uh, look into the like you know uh, IWS uh, stats, and uh, by 2030 there is a huge market uh, for big data, which is around 13 trillion, and Bangladesh having like you know the uh, perfect uh, support from government and. Uh, the right kind of resources, if we can train up uh, for for future, we can actually like you know get the best uh, uh, benefit out of this uh, opportunities that we can tap uh, right here. Already we are like you know using NID biometric systems, but in future we can better this all this uh, item that I've mentioned. Uh, we are already like you know working with uh, prevention of ATM fraud. We are doing the EKYC. Uh, in fact, BrainStation has, like, you know, developed an EKYC system with uh, machine learning, which can actually, like, you know, detect the real-time image. So EKYC has been, uh, like, you know, has been used by many of the fintech organizations across uh, our country. Uh, and our country has uh, a lot of, like, you know, uh, there are a lot of startups regarding e-healthcare. And they're actually, like, you know, data would add more value in terms of their business growth, in terms of their, you uh, know, like you know, serving their customers better or give the better services um, in general. So, digitizing driver slices is also a, a particular need that I I see, and our road safety is always has been an issue, and which we can improve uh, through um, data, big data, and analytics. So the part the the industry that get the most uh, benefit in Bangladesh, I would say, healthcare would be the one. Uh, then science, security, and business all together. So what are the challenges? I think uh, Dohib has mentioned that we have a lack of sufficiently skilled IT uh, resources. Um, and uh, the cost of technology is huge whenever we're talking about like, you know, um, big data in general or any uh, cutting edge technology uh, what, that can be machine learning or artificial intelligence and any other cutting edge uh, that we're talking about. So we um, have lack of sufficiently skilled IT staffs, uh, and it is uh, sort of a, a problem for all of the people across the globe. It's not like in Bangladesh we're lacking uh, big data skill, uh, like those experts or uh, big data analytics expert or uh, the data uh, analytics expert. It's it's like it's a global uh, scarcity that uh, we are having, but the right kind of people can actually train. Like you know, one people can train other 10 or 100 uh, people. So the people we need is uh, is uh, who can actually like, train the uh, like, you know, future uh, generation and he can actually guide um, him or her or the whole bunch of group who can actually like, you know, develop their career for future. So we also have challenges regarding security and uh, data growth and quality and the tool selection, we all always have uh, a problem regarding tool selections. So these challenges we can actually mitigate by basic training. We can give basic training to the people who are enthusiastic about data science. Um, we can we can give them like you know um, some um, some idea and direction about modern techniques which they can use. Uh, the cybersecurity professionals we have to hire. Whenever we're thinking about building a certain solutions um, with cutting edge technologies, and all, of course we have to go for professional help, like the consultants, like uh, Saki Pai, who can actually, uh, like you know, help you out in in those areas. So, in Bangladesh, when um, uh, Women in Big Data actually uh, launched, uh, we had a vision that we want to uh, build our, uh, like you know, females or women population. Uh, for like you know in data science so that they can aid uh, in uh, in the future um, of uh, business. So what we are looking for is basically we are uh, trying to collaborate with different organizations or different um, facilitator group uh, to sort of uh, getting their help uh, to provide uh, um, like you no know, mentorship uh, for the um, for the women who are actually uh, who want to. Um, develop their career in data science. So that
that is our plan and uh, for that we would be like you know, launching basic trainings and mentorship and we would uh, do some career advice as well there would be job boards virtual job affair uh, job fairs and for basic trainings we would be like you know seeking uh, the right people who are highly motivated and enthusiastic uh, to uh, teach the future generation so in currently we see that in ict uh, industry in bangladesh only 16 percent uh, uh, like you know uh, of the workforce is women and uh, if we if we consider it uh, who are working with data analytics that would be uh, even even less so we want to create an ecosystem where the where our women would be getting ready for uh, like you know data analytics and uh, data science but we also want to uh, create a nation where um, we would have like um, the best resources for data science as well so yeah that was shortly what i uh, wanted to present thank you so much tisha i mean that's yeah. a lot to think about uh you've already uh, posed a few questions for me to ask uh, but we'll go for that in the q a round i want to just move on to the next part of data i mean um I'm sure throughout this entire exciting week of AIWS, um, it, it, every panel has so intrinsically dissected and you know delved into every aspect of uh, AI. And it starts from data, right? I mean, AI is like a child and you rear that child with that data. If you don't give them the right data, they don't do the job properly. Mm -hmm. So why I mentioned this is actually we're going to go into a data scientist right now. And he's actually someone who's much more closer to home, if we consider Singapore home, uh, of my friend B, uh, the organizers. And his name is Khan Mohammed Sakifolalo. Again, another individual with a lot of hats and a lot of accolades to his name, but I'll try to mention a few. Um, all of them aren't possible today. First of all, uh, he's the analytics advisor to uh, an AI company in Bangladesh, uh, Intelligent Machines Limited. Secondly, he's working as a program manager of trust and safety for the South Asia region of TikTok. And he's also a Commonwealth scholar at the National University of Singapore. He's also taught here in Bangladesh uh, at North South University as a senior lecturer. So he's had a lot of engagement with students. He still mentors at Upscale right now. And uh, his research right now focuses on the strategic value of data, science, data and scenarios and futures. So uh, I think we'd like uh, Mr. Sakib to tell us about what is the future of data science, maybe starting with what it is right now. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maiman. And I hope all of you can hear me, right? So uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. And yeah, that's a very long introduction and I'm sorry for that. But yeah, I'm actually very lucky to be here with someone who's actually my mentor in this area, um, Bijan Islam Bhai. I mean, they, I've always looked up to Bijan Bhai, Ifdad Bhai, um, Zahid Bhai, Light Castle has always been a place where, like even when I visit Bangladesh every single time, I would visit there. And also Tawhid Bhai, who helped me get out there have a very nice interview in his platform. I think it was in 2017, and I'm very grateful for that as well. It's like a big um, opportunity to be with both of you. And Tisha, yes, we act, we also met and had disc like long discussions about data. So to start with, um, can I share my screen, Maimon? Please go for it. Cool. So. In the panel, I'm glad that um, Tawhid Bhai talked about the how we are still at the doorstep of data-driven decision-making, data science, and how Bijan Bhai said that, yes, many startups are coming up and the place is just setting up. And finally, Tisha confirmed in terms of like, you know, how data can help and what are the opportunities there. So what I'm going to talk about is something which is very dear to me, two things actually. Uh, the first one is actually um, in terms of like, you know, we understand the importance of data. We understand how it can benefit us, how it can change the society. But now, how can we um, implement it? So how to build a data DNA? So how can a data business be data? So to start with, um, just if I give a very short overview of what do we consider to be data science. So uh, this is actually a very good um, definition, which is collected from um, Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Their machine learning and data science co is actually one of the best I've worked with. So they say that uh, data science has five parts. 
So it starts with capturing, that is, you know, identifying what can be measured, how that should be measured, understanding the biases in collecting. This is something Tawhid Bhai mentioned in terms of, yeah, data science can be very biased and it can be. And that's where it comes in, like the issue of ethics in data in terms of, you know, when you're capturing, are you capturing the right thing? Are we capturing in a way that is fair to everyone? Because data science fairness is another issue that will become very important in the future. So then from capturing, it's all about maintaining, which is where, um, like the company teacher represents um, the groups teacher represents like Amazon Web Services, Google Data, uh, Google Data Studio, or uh, Google Cloud Platform, uh, Microsoft Azure. These are the places on deciding, you know, how to store the data. Then, in terms of storing, from storing to processing, bringing in analysis. They, this process and analysis is the part where I work with most, with tools to you know make sense out of data to help a company take a decision out of data. And the last part, which is something I always highlight a little bit in every talk I have been to, is communication. And that is so important. And that is something that I've seen from my experience with data science um, youngsters, that this part is missed out a lot of times. Because in the end, data science could be complicated. It will have lots of statistical models. It will have lots of coding and it will have a lot of number outputs. But what matters the most is a numeric output or a, even a chart means nothing if it is not properly communicated. A few days back, I was actually lucky to meet someone who leads the data visualization team in um, The Economist, the well-known um, weekly publication, The Economist. And she actually showed me a list of stuff they have in terms of like, you know, what ways to communicate or when to communicate what. And they think that no matter what the data is, it's the communication that is very important because that gets you make a decision that lets you properly understand the insight from the data and apply it to an action. So this five things like it's a five tier approach towards data science and data science actually covers all these five issues. Now to go forward with, you know, to discuss how to implement this for an organization. So before that, um, in terms of implementation, I actually sh like to share a story. It's a, it's not a personal story. It's a story from the second world war. So, and it's a very like, this story, I know that we do have less time, but still I will share this story because this story actually highlights something very important about the whole field of data. So this is a bomber. This is a second World War II bomber. Um, it's, the Americans used to fondly call it the flying fortress because it was very big and very powerful. And it was in the latest stage of um, the second World War where this bomber was utilized to bomb Germany. Now, what used to happen is when these bombers used to leave, a lot of them didn't come back. The casualty rate was almost 70%. That means out of 100 planes that used to go, only, 70 come, uh, only 30 come back, 70 were shot down by Germans. Now, war is an expensive issue and 70 planes is pretty damn expensive. So right at that point, um, popular, like we do have some popular movies like um, imitation games. So like, you know, like, the military were setting up partnerships with universities to research and to find out and like, you know, get edges, competitive edges in the war against the enemy. So there was this project called SRI, Strategic Research Initiative, where um, the government, like the British government partnered with Oxford and Cambridge to research on, you know, uh, like how can we improve the casualty rate of these planes? So what they did was on those times, it was the most comprehensively collected data sets. Like every single plane that used to come back, they would chart every single bullet holes that plane had, every single places where it got shot. And then they will merge these diagrams together to find a pattern that, you know, these are the places in the plane where they are getting shot the most. So why not reinforce them with better aluminum so that they survive? No matter how much re reinforcement was given, there was not much improvement. The casualty rate reduced from 70% to 65 to 62%, but that's it. After a certain point, a scientist came up and he said that, you know, whatever you're doing, the data is correct, but whatever the next steps you're doing is completely wrong. So um, it can act as a puzzle. And if you could have guessed by the time I like, what could be the answer, but let me give the answer because we are 
uh, like short of time. So the answer was the scientists told them that, you know, the planes that are coming back, you're taking the data from them and the stress on the word that they are coming back. If they're coming back, that means they survived. That means they are not casualties, which means you don't have the data on casualties. But what can you do to guess the data on casualties? So the idea is simple. If the plane is coming back and it got hit in certain places, that means those hits are not critical, which basically means that if anywhere else the plane was hit, it might have been critical and which is why the planes didn't come back. So the guesstimate could be that, you know, instead of reinforcing the areas that got hit multiple times, reinforce the areas that were never hit because maybe the planes which got shot down were hit on those areas. Just this simple suggestion, reduce the casualty rate from 62 to 32%, almost halved it. And this story is so important because today, as Tisha was putting it, we live in the age of big data. Data is not like finding data is not a challenge anymore. They're like for individuals like us, we have trillions of data out there. So data is there. The problem, the challenge lies in asking the right question. Like if you don't ask the right question to the data, no matter how rich your data set is, you will not get the benefits from it. And that's where moving on, I'm gonna suggest um, this approach. Now this is something, um, it's not developed by me, I can assure you on that, but it's like not you know written in stone, but this is based on our multiple experiences of making a business data driven. So the first step actually starts with understanding the data readiness. By data readiness, I mean, an organization needs to first be honest with itself that, you know, to what extent are they collecting data? What, what's like how much data has been collected and how much can they collect it? So the data readiness gives them an idea of that. So in Bangladesh, uh, the good thing that we see is more and more organizations are being aware of data. And I would say that they are like entering the first stage of data readiness where they are aware and they are having systems to collect data or even have collected some basic data already. Few companies are in Bangladesh actually reached quite a high level of data readiness. If you ask me for examples, I'll give you Robi, I'll give you Patao, I'll give you Bcash. These are organizations that have reached a good, like a high level of data readiness right now. So after in, like understanding the level of data readiness of an organization, it needs to plan. So if the readiness is not there, it needs to first understand its whole business model. There are tools like business model canvas, lean canvas, use them to understand the full data, full business model, and then identify each and every stages in this business model where data can be collected, what data can be collected, and how can that data be used? And how does that data matches with the vision, mission, and the strategy of the organization at large? Which is why sometimes it is advisable to actually not start for the whole business, but identify a single process, the key process of that business, the major process, the, most, the process that is most relevant to the vision and mission of the organization. Then pick up that process and identify for that process what data needs to be collected. And the third step is basically that, data manning the data collection plan. And here, two, two things needs to be put in like stress. One is where to collect the data from. And two is also how fair that data is. What are the limitations to that data? So if I give a personal example, um, like from a project that I've done. So a few years back, I was working with this data for um, one Indonesian bank where we were looking into building a machine learning model to predict the you know, credit risk of an individual. Now, after we were looking into the data and we fit in the models and everything without looking at the limitations, we figured out that our model was very much biased against people who didn't have enough money. The model was only giving money out to people who had already enough money. In that case, this would be bad because that organization, that bank was trying to help the poor, but the Machine learning algorithm figured out that poor people are more likely to default. So we didn't have that un understanding of the data limitation. But then we segregated the model into two groups, a model which would help poor to get credit risk certified and a model which would help the rich to also get their credit risk measured. And 
to fairly assign loans because if you don't if you're not clear about the data limitations your machine learning model your ai might be super unfair so that was a very like hard earned lesson for us in 2018 when we saw that and we were actually like when we saw the outcomes we were even like even i was ashamed of the model i fitted because i'm like okay my model is actually biasing against i mean the income status of people which is really horrible i would say so the third step is very important in terms of this, that to understand the limitations of the data so that you know that what are the lackings in the data to be aware when building these model. The fourth step is actually like collection biases as well, which falls under the limitations. The fifth step is getting the data to first explore the data to see, you know, what are the patterns, what are the relationships, so all these things. And then, because sometimes, it turns out that you know you have some pre pre concepts like you know uh, presumed concepts like this is this might be what it looks like but when you receive it you feel like okay this is completely different than what you expected and that's what exploratory data analysis is about you look at the pattern of the data you look at the picture and the picture can actually highlight a lot of stuff there then the fourth step is actually do the analysis and when doing the analysis you need to keep in mind that your goal would be to match with the organization's goal. As an analyst, you should analyze in a way that matches the organization's strategy, vision, mission. So for example, if you are an analyst for Toyota, then your target would be to do analysis in order to increase life, um, the life of an engine. And at the same time, making the whole system as economic as possible. So aligning your analysis approach to the organization's strategy. Then finally, when you have done one set, think how you can automate this whole process. Because when you have automated it, that's where you can build in AI. And when you have done one set of automation, what happens is when you start this journey, um, in the first two steps, the person you are, in the sixth step, the person you would be, would be utterly different. You'll face many challenges. You'll learn so much about the whole system, about the whole organization and how it handles data, and also how people fare with data that you'll be a completely changed person. And then when you uh, take these understandings back to the system, that's where you have the learning, you have the experience of automating, you merge them together to scale this data-driven process across an organization. So this is one way. And again, I'm saying that this is not coined in stone and this is not a like theory. It's based on experience that we have worked on. So this is my approach. If you would uh, like, if you would ask me for advice on how a company can be data driven, this is the approach. Other than that, now I saw another question in the um, seminar as well about the future of skill force in AI, right? So the second thing that I'm going to share, because I have been working as a trainer to, you know, educate people about the strategic value of data, how to be an analyst, how to be a business, in business intelligence expert, as well as a machine learning expert. So data science is actually a marriage of three things, coding, statistics, and domain. If I go by one at a time, so the most important thing about data science is, because, is statistics, because in the end, you have data, but statistics is the whole science of making sense of data, getting outputs from data. So these are some of the suggestions I have to learn from, like learn about statistics, like probabilities, statistical texts, tests, the concepts of significance, all of these things can be learned from Khan Academy. I find their videos very useful. Another is a very good book and a website called Open Intro Stats. So if anyone listening to this if is interested to know detail about them, you're more than welcome to contact me. Also, I will be sharing these slide decks so that you're more than welcome to contact Finby to get these slides and information here. The second set is understanding of the tools that you need to use. And that's where I have found this person's um, YouTube channel, StatQuest, to be incredibly useful. The guy actually starts every video with a small, small poem or a song part, and then explains a tool so nicely that it makes, it makes the whole step much easier. In terms of coding, you would need, like after a certain point, you would need knowledge on like, you know, either R coding or Python. So for R, data camp is a wonderful place to learn. Kaggle is a good, Kaggle has some useful tutorials on Python. And if you're working with big data at a time, after a certain point, you would also need SQL. And to learn SQL, I'm like the one, one of the best places I've seen is W3 schools. 
The final part is actually the harder part is the domain knowledge. So what do we mean by domain knowledge? Data science is something that can be applied in business, medicine, healthcare, governance, almost anywhere, anywhere that can, that um, values evidence-based decision-making. So where do we, so it, you require domain knowledge, but how do you develop that? So one is experience in working in different domains. The second is actually working on personal projects. Projects in like, you can find these projects in like Kaggle, the data sets are available in Kaggle, UCI machine learning repository, Google data set search. So there are many, many, many data out there and you, you don't need to just, you know, be hired in a project. You can just start on your own project and have a personal project, analyze the data, learn while also analyzing. And you can, all, you can share the project. There are places like GitHub, or you can actually share the project in your um, blog where, uh, you know, I mean, you can highlight your capabilities and that would give you recruiters an idea how capable you are in terms of coding and analysis. The, the last thing I'm gonna share here is actually, this is my favorite quote. So I talk about statistics, coding, machine learning a lot, and like um, I'm gonna call me a data scientist, although I'm very skeptical about that term, that whether I fit the match yet. So I started my journey as a business graduate and actually none of my degrees are in mathematics or computer science or coding. All my degrees are in business, but it's something that I started being interested in, started self teaching myself. And trust me, the amount of fails I had like massive amounts of fails and it was a hard journey. And that's why I keep telling people that, you know, the best way to learn is actually trying it out yourself failing multiple times. If you don't fail, then you should be worried about the fact that whether you're learning the right thing or not. Fail multiple times, fail early, fail quickly, learn from the failures, and you'll mature as a data, like as a data analyst and a data scientist. So that's from my side. I'm sorry I took some time and went like a freaking train, but yeah, we did have some time constraints. So there you go. Thank you so much, Sakib. Um, whoa, that was a lot of information. And it's a lot of good information. So uh, I hope everyone benefited. We'll try to get back to you with some questions in the Q&A. Um, but we are running short on time. Um, we are trying to finish uh, by Singapore time uh, uh, 7.10. So we'll go on to our last speaker of today. And uh, I think we want to save AI implementation for last. And Mr. Topunawaz exemplifies that. Now. Um, his designations are as the Senior Vice President of Technology of Shohos. Shohos in Bengali means easy, and they're one of the top super apps in the country right now. He's also the Director of Secure Link Services Limited. He has 21 years of software development experience, and he is a CTO for the last eight years. He has single-handedly recruited and mentored 200 developers, consulted customers from more than 30 products from all over Europe and made over $15 million in sales possible. So I think he has an excellent, you know, application of AI uh, in a, in a multi-level startup. And I'll just hand over uh, the floor to Topu Bhai. And I think it's very important I should say what Bhai means because we have been using Bhai and Apu a lot. I do not think the AI, as you can see in the text reader, being able to understand that. And that is one of the limitations, right? As Saki was saying before, that uh, if you don't feed the information, if you don't ask the right questions, the AI doesn't know that Bhai means brother in Bengali and Apu means sister in Bengali. So I'm have, you know, handing it over to Tavu Bhai and we've saved the best for last, the experience for last. And uh, Tavu Bhai, please, uh, wow us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Great. So, yeah. So first, let me come out clean. I am not an expert on AI. I actually, I'm actually like, you can, I could actually say that I know nothing about AI, but that would be a bit overstatement. I know something about AI. I'm basically a program and an architect. I've worked many years in software development. I have built large enterprise applications. And uh, I've been calling people dinosaurs all my life for not learning new technology. But if you look at me now, I am probably one of those dinosaurs who did not take the time to learn AI. And today here at this session, I'll be coming in as a uh, person who, who has a lot of question about AI, uh, going through a lot of trouble or problems in his current products, 
that requires some form of UI because he cannot himself solve these problems with his, his knowledge and uh, the enterprise architectural uh, way. There has to be something beyond that, beyond his knowledge capability. That, that person is me today. So I'll be not talking about solutions today. I'm, I'm here to learn mostly, but I'll be presenting a set of problems that I have that are currently facing and working with these problems. And I believe those problems requires extensive implementation of uh, big data, machine learning, and AI. So uh, please allow me to present. Like I, I made a very simple presentation for this. Um, uh, I'll be explaining a bit about the, the, the uh, startup market here. So let me first uh, explain it in a bit, like maybe in two minutes, that what Shahoz does. Shahoz is a startup. Uh, uh, started working uh, in 2014, started with bus ticketing service. Now we have ride sharing. Uh, we also have uh, food delivery. Uh, we have um, telemedicine. We have uh, trucks. Uh, also, we are, we, are, uh, we are going into many other things. I mean, this continues to grow. We have raised a lot of money uh, over the last of, uh, three, four years. Uh, and uh, it's one of the most prominent startups in Bangladesh. And I'm, I'm working there as, as, as the SVP tech. And I'm responsible for uh, building the next generation software, uh, the platform for Shahoj. And uh, so, so do that. Um, yeah, and I'm building like really strong microservice architecture, event-driven, secure kind of uh, systems. But then I got stuck with problems like this. So allow me, please allow me to uh, share my screen with the presentation. And uh, I hope can see this. This is a very naive approach to a presentation. Uh, Perfect. So yeah, so, so we are a multi-vertical uh, uh, startup. We, 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 we have uh, different verticals, as I said already. And let's start with ride sharing. So with ride sharing, there are three problems that I cannot solve without AI, as it seems to me. I don't know like, if you'll agree it or not. So let me explain those problems one by one. I will not take too much time. So first problem is the supply demand problem. So as a ride sharing platform, we need to predict the demand of ride requests in certain areas and be, be, employed to be able to deploy supply or the riders into those areas. So how do you do that? For example, there are places like Mohammedpur, Dhanmondi, that this, this, this places has a uh, regular uh, need of different rides. And based on the part of the time of the day, uh, these uh, demands changes. So how do we predict and how do we uh, figure out a way to, to put those information to the riders so that they can be available in those areas so that those, those people who are trying to look for a ride, they can get the rides easily. This is a problem that, that we cannot solve without him. I mean, we have to, I mean, the, the, from my very uh, basic understanding of it, yeah, we have to uh, train a model in a way by providing all the ride data and order and supply uh, uh, data into that model and then uh, ask it to predict that what is going to be uh, the demand for a specific period of time of that day and then uh, send the necessary uh, like incentives to the riders so that they're, they're in that part of the uh, city. So that is, that is the first problem that, that we need AI to solve in, in, in our, our business. And then there is this route selection problem and this route selection problem is uh, important because uh, I mean a lot of a lot of the companies here in, in Bangladesh uh, and many of the part of the world they mostly use Google Maps as the route uh, routing application and Google Maps has become extremely expensive over the last one year. They actually raised their price uh, tenfold, and uh, it's a huge impact on the business because we will be paying like like hundreds and thousands of dollars. To, to just to pay Google to uh, provide this route selection. So we need to find out a way to build our own mapping technology and be able to train our system because there are a lot of information in there that needs to be uh, analyzed, processed, and find the best route for a specific time of the day and so on, based on the traffic information and how the roads are closed and not. And these, these things, I think, requires a lot of data and training of a model so that that could provide us uh, the right kind of route. 
Then the pricing problem. So, you know, like ride sharing pricings are 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 um, not not fixed. So it it, it 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 based on different variables. It goes up and down. There are surges and so on and stuff like that. So so this dynamic pricing of a ride would require some form of AI implementation uh, that would look at the uh, uh, supply demand, that would look at the previous price, how people have canceled, at what price range and so on, and then find out the right kind of price which would be beneficial for the organization and also beneficial for the uh, other two parties, the rider and the uh, user that is using the ride. So this dynamic pricing, finding the right dynamic kind of uh, way of pricing a ride is another area that, that requires some form of uh, AI. Um, if I move on, uh, the food delivery, it has even a, a, even a larger uh, set of problems because uh, first problem that we're right now uh, struggling with is how to select a delivery agent for a specific food delivery. Because um, if you look at the problem here, so there are like a lot of restaurants in specific areas and there are, there are different, uh, many delivery agents moving into that area and then orders are coming from, from this different part of the city. So the uh, way we have to identify it is that we have to be able to batch maximum number of orders per rider so that we have the minimum number of traveling between the restaurant and the, uh, uh, the uh, place where the order needs to be delivered. And then we need to be able to batch them and find out the right delivery agent with right kind of vehicle so that uh, the amount of food that needs to be delivered can be fit and can be sent in the fastest, uh, fastest uh, way, like fastest time. So this is a quite complex problem. There are too many variables. I mean, we, we figured out there are like more than 30, 40 variables in here that needs to be considered. And it's a, it's a, I mean, if you, if you look at it like very simple, it's an NP complete problem. But I think uh, with, with, uh, with uh, the implementation of EY, AI, uh, this problem could be uh, benefited, uh, could benefit a lot. Then with food delivery, we have a uh, problem uh, that we need to solve is the recommendation that there are some ready-made solution out of uh, AWS, uh, personalized and, and that kind of thing. But this is also a problem that we need to solve that whenever somebody's uh, ordering a food, we need to upsell, right? So we need to show that user that, hey, these are the other food that you might like based on his taste, based on his previous orders and so on. So uh, we need to find, and that, that, re that requires a, uh, I mean, I think this is a quite solved problem at this point uh, with the AI community um, that uh, how to provide recommendation. And uh, there is still no like uh, homegrown technology for this. We are very much dependent on, on AWS and uh, our, our uh, own uh, modeling, like our internal software doesn't have this functionality. And so this is another area we, 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 we were really looking into to find out how, we, how to provide a uh, proper uh, recommendation. Then incentivization problem, that is another problem that we need to be able to incentivize users by providing discounts and the, uh, the riders, the, the, the delivery agents, so that they uh, are more active and be, be, be in the business. So how to provide this in incentivize by keeping the burn rate low for the company, but still giving enough incentive at the right places to the right person based on the trend and behavior of that user and the rider. So that is also another problem that we are struggling with. We need a lot of, um, a lot of, we need to like, I mean, this is a very economic thing as well for the organization. The organization could save a lot of money by figuring out the right way of uh, incentivizing because as you can, as you know, that most of the uh, startups, they spend a lot of money on, 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 on uh, discounts and this kind of incentivization. And this could totally change the game for a startup uh, if we could find out a proper uh, model uh, for incentivizing uh, this user, uh, this user and drivers. And then the uh, last but not least, uh, the fraud detection. That is one huge problem, huge problem uh, for the whole industry in ride sharing and also as well as food delivery, because a uh, lot of lot of frauds are happening. So they're, they're like industrialized like uh, offices, 
like people they have like 200 phones and like 500 and like 1000 sim cards and they're like uh, placing orders and like uh, not delivering the product but still like uh, do, using fake gps to uh, show that okay the ride has been made or the food delivery has been made and trying to uh, capture the discount that has been provided so this fraud detection is, is a huge problem we will lose a lot of money out of this and our data analytics team, they're struggling to find out the right kind of fraud, finding out like clusters. Okay, well, these are the, uh, these few um, providers are only serving these few users. So that's a cluster. So that's probably a fraud ring and things like that. So we could use uh, AI here to find out pattern in that data, uh, train it in a way so that we could detect a fraud uh, transaction as it happens, block the transaction, block the payment and so on. So, yeah, I will not go too far uh, uh, from this. So, what I'm trying to say here that this whole industry I I with the startup, there we are we are having so many problems. But but look at the bright side. I mean, we have amazing amount of data. We have so many data. We have user behavior data, the order data, and all this data. And they those data are just stuck there in our database and just because we do not have the right kind of capacity capability within the organization or available within the country we we cannot simply use them and that's a huge challenge for us because uh, we really don't know how to address this we we, we can we uh, hire university fresh graduates to do the job for us how, how are we going to get the uh, data expert who is going to help us with the, with the model because we are not research organization we cannot do that we need people who already knows how to do this stuff and we need we just only need to implement it we are not researchers we are not universities we cannot do this ourselves the only way for us to be able to and we are not big like google we cannot have a separate department who are doing this kind of thing we cannot do that we are under huge constraints so the question is that how can we address this how more uh, we, can there be organizations who can help us with this kind of analytics, designing and um, uh, building the building the, the right kind of model, uh, providing us a like as a service maybe I don't know maybe this that could be a possibility that could be an organization and that could be built up that hey we provide you uh, like machine learning as a service so you give us your problem give us your data we build the model and deliver so this kind of things we are looking forward to it. So, uh, Maimon, I, I will not go any farther. Uh, please uh, take it over from here. So, I'm just talking about problems here today. I'm not no solutions, and but really looking forward. I mean, that, is a, that was an amazing discussion. I learned a lot, uh, and uh, I would like to know that um, if anybody could provide us any guidance how to move forward from there, that would be really great. Thank you very much. Amazing, Tohu. I mean, I think what we could take away from each of the speakers. You know, we, we were very candid and we were very open to what, uh, you know, I, I think present constraints are and what these could be opportunities in the future. I was reading a book, uh, it was called The Tech Whisper by this Indian gentleman, and it's really nice. And um, he gives an example of a tsunami, but I will give an example of a volcano. So the 4IR and AI, I, I look at it like a volcano. And when it erupts, you know, it, you know, everything is shaking and moving. And, uh, you know, it's kind of destroying a lot of things in its path. When the lava comes and takes uh, shape. However, when the lava settles, things are forever changed. The surface change. Um, how, you know, uh, the, the mantle is, how the surface is. You look at things differently, right? To me, that's what, you know, AI is. I'm sorry, in, in the whole excitement of talking about this amazing panel and about this topic, I forgot to you know, give my own introduction today. So I am uh, very humble and a very, uh, I think, mediocre uh, CEO of a business consultancy company. We are in the connectivity business that we say. Uh, we connect businesses together. We understand that a concierge service is good, but at the end of the day, we will be con competing with machines. Because when I joined Global Chamber as the executive director, I learned that we were using AI to find out new generation companies and lo locate the next generation prospects. So I know that I have to up my game. What we then pride ourselves to do is to be intermediaries, 
And I think that's kind of somehow it links with what everyone said today. The data is there. Which data we have to collect, how we have to collect it. And the last five minutes that we do have, and we'll try to wrap it up. I'm gonna ask just a minute questions to everyone that's present here today. And I think we'll go into a photo op after that. So first to uh, Khan Mohammed Sagi uh, do we have you with us? Amazing. Uh, when I said that the Hupai was the best, uh, I think again, you're a teacher, you'll understand this. So I hated differentiation when I was uh, in my early classes and uh, I hated the theory. But then when I got to see the application of it, it actually felt good. So to a lot of our audiences, the best would be because we heard about the real world application. For all of this crazy technology that we are talking about, all of these data terms. But finally, when it goes into application, we feel a little bit home. But you see, I think the progression today of every speaker kind of gave us that idea, right? So the first question, I think I'll go in reverse order. Uh, this is to uh, Topo Nawaz. So in Bangladesh, we do have uh, a requirement for data processing for ML and for AI services. So we are looking for these collaboration solutions, I assume. Yes, definitely. I mean, there has to be some kind of collaborations. And as I said, we don't even know who to talk to. I mean, there is no real concrete platform that where I can go and figure out how and what to do with this data that we have and how, who to talk to about this platform. I mean, I, have, I, have, I went to universities. Uh, universities have their own way of doing things. But then again, the universities are also uh, quite... Uh, like constrained by many facts. They have their own syllabus to deal with and maybe only the masters and uh, PhD programs can and can work with stuff like that. And I mean, even, even for example, even if we want to uh, go for an MOU uh, with an university, that itself is a, is a complex problem because I mean, the universities cannot uh, just sign an MOU. Uh, there are issues they, have, they, have, they have, may have to go to the vice chancellor. So, you know, like the, just by the sheer bureaucracy, it becomes very difficult to uh, find the right kind of people uh, to, to talk to. And, um, and uh, I, I really appreciate, or maybe, I mean, there is a need, maybe, maybe nobody's looking at this. There, there is a need of having organization, even business organization, just providing this service for all these startups that, hey, we are a company, we are capable of deliver, taking a problem taking your data and providing a data model and, and, and a solution to that, that helps your business. If somebody comes up with such an organization, just publish it properly, reach out all to this, all these startups. And it's a huge business opportunity, I believe. And, but I, I don't know how that, that is gonna happen. And like, um, and all the discussion that I hear about AI is still very, uh, uh, I'm sorry for using the term superficial it sounds because uh, like it's very much theoretical and, uh, and it, it, it sounds that like it's, 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 a, it's a topic of uh, like very higher intellect and stuff like that. But I mean, there are real life problems that need to be solved. And then, then the people who are involved in AI and machine learning, they need to come to the ground and look at the real problem that we're having and try to solve them. All right, brilliant. Uh, it's a very uh, hardcore fact. I'll, I'll move on to Khan Mohamed Sakiflalam quickly. So I think an important issue was uh, spoken about universities. How can we equip our university students and of course our teachers as well to uh, you know, integrate with the latest uh, AI concepts that are also practically implementable and actually, you know, they can actually help their jobs and help companies like Short. So um, for universities, as the Pupai was mentioning, and I worked in five years in a university, the problem is universities can't move very fast. And that's also because the universities need approval from University Grants Commission to offer a new course and then to have teachers teach that. So what we see right now, and also universities um, while teaching, they need, they, they have quite like Bangladesh has some limitations. For example, I was very stunned to figure out one limitation a few days back when a uh, university was very interested to have me as a part-time uh, faculty from Singapore, like weekly I'll take three hour classes and like introduce analytics to them. But then we figured out that Bangladesh, we have a rule where the university faculty needs to be physically present in Bangladesh. 
So if we can't go beyond these um, dinosaur age rules, and if we don't move fast, it would be hard. It would be very hard to introduce these courses. And at the same time, we need to encourage people to come back because people who are going, so I've also, as a mentor, I have faced this problem again and again and again. When someone wants to go and study machine learning, study analytics, they're being very discouraged by their society because their surroundings, because they're like Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, there is no field for it. But I have to fight again and again, telling people that no, there is a field for it. There is not, like it's the other way around. We don't have the supply to it. So these are the reasons why people, like we still don't have enough supply and we need to create that um, approach where even universities needs to be told that, you know, we need to design these courses. Some universities are already on the process of designing, but this process needs to move faster because I understand um, the Bhubhai's issue. And yes, that's actually a key issue. Right now, we don't have enough um, experts in this line. Thank you for that comment i think it gives a you know a lot of uh, interest also like uh, so something i would like to also sure. add is um this is to topu bhai as well i feel like uh, organizations are more and more into this like into using their data i think organizations need to need to also think of starting an empty program on this because you can't really expect experienced data people at this point in the market because bangladesh universities and the marketplace is very new so the way to handle a new skill in a market is actually creating a good empty program because when you have an empty program you will have trainers so i have gone into training for even indian companies who are who have empty program in data and i have trained their mts so you can always train from scratch Brilliant, brilliant. I'll just uh, try to just give the last question for today and uh, try to sum up. Tisha, this is to you. Um, I think all of this is aligning. There's room for collaboration in Bangladesh, right? Um, Bangladesh, uh, when people say the data is the new oil, I'd like to think it's not oil, it's renewable energy because data is always being generated, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we are always having a huge capacity of it as mentioned by the Bupai. Do you believe that uh, there are a lot of, you know, uh, I think there was a question as well in, in the Q&A that uh, can new vendors come into Bangladesh uh, and can they collaborate with existing companies like yours? Yeah, I think uh, we already doing that. My mind. So in Brain Station 23, what is happening? We have a dedicated AI team who are working in collaboration with Buet, uh, with another university in the US. It, it is one of the top. I, I think... Uh, with MIT, there is a collaboration. So there is a try, uh, like academia and industry getting uh, the collaboration in the same uh, platform. So there are scope for collaborations already. Some works are uh, going on, but we don't have any clue about it. So what we are lacking is also like, you know, connecting the right kind of people with the right kind of organization. So suppose like, you know, uh, uh, companies like Brain Station or Machine uh, Intelligent Machines, they're already doing like you know, um, uh, like data modeling or uh, working, uh, like working with uh, cutting edge technologies like AI or machine learning. So you know, but we don't have we don't as a as a like you know Bangladeshi company. Those companies are not getting enough exposure in the local market as well. Like you know, in local market we have a lot of like you know startup companies or uh, like you know uh, enterprises or SMBs who are looking for uh, particular solutions like how they can actually optimize their data and can get the best results uh, from those data. But we don't know where to approach. So I think there are scope of collaboration. Also, we need to like, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, promote all those companies who are working with the cutting edge technology uh, mm -hmm. in the market so that uh, in future, because these companies are already working for uh, global industry. So why not like, you know, helping out the local industry as well. So we have to like, you know, as a uh, like, you know, sort of, sort of uh, posh bearer, we have to do that. We have to promote those companies. We have to um, sort of uh, building the breach between like you know, organizations so that they can collaboratively can come up with uh, better solutions. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone today uh, who's been on the panel. Mr. Bijon had to leave. Um, Bangladesh has the second largest online labor force. Uh, we are ready for partnerships, we are ready for collaborations. If we were perfect, there would be no need
to want to engage new business. It's an open gold mine. We'd want international players, we want international partners to come and you know engage with us, share knowledge with us. And I think there's a scope for learning, a scope for direct uh, AI products, and there's scope for direct vendorships. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your time today. I think we learned a lot. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with any of the people here, please do. And we hope that through, uh, you know, AIWS 2020, 2021, and privileged to be the last session of today, um, we can connect with the, any of these players in Bangladesh. We'd be happy to connect you to more and uh, we can find solutions together and, uh, you know, uh, rise together in the AI age. Thank you very much. I think we'll be taking a photo shoot together. Is that all right? Yes. Thank you, Maimoon and all the speakers. May we have everyone to switch on your video. You can also remove your headset. Okay, okay ready? Look at the camera. Okay, ready? One, two, three, smile. Again, ready? One, two, three, smile. Thank you, Maimoon. Dear speakers, moderators and attendees, do not go just yet. After this, we will be observing an MOU signing between MyFinB and MF MCFG. May I, may I first invite Mr. M. Nazri to give the speech. Thank you. If you can activate my video, uh, that'd be great. I was barred from switching on my video so that I don't photobomb uh, the distinguished uh, members of the panel. Okay, hi everybody. Firstly, Good thank you. you so much uh, for the fantastic sharing. Very frank, very candid, very observant, certainly, uh, of the latest trends, dynamics, and into the future of, of Bangladesh uh, digital landscape. Uh, this uh, particular MOU brings uh, many uh, significance and many meaning, meanings to us because uh, we, of, we have always viewed uh, Bangladesh as a, as a very big, important market. Uh, it's a volume game, if you think commercially, and it's a, it has a deep social impact uh, potential if we were to uh, think of it from a non-commercial point of view. So um, balancing both, uh, we all look forward to a very sustainable partnership with you know, goals, uh, sustainable goals to be achieved. And this is where um, you know, our partnership with MCFG uh, comes into play. Uh, there are several uh, key areas of partnerships that we are pursuing uh, with uh, MCFG for Bangladesh. And, and certainly it's meant to be inclusive, yeah? So it doesn't mean that both parties sign, doesn't mean that we cannot form partnerships and grow partnerships along the way. This is just a starting point and a commitment uh, for us to actually uh, walk the talk and start uh, implementing some of this in stages. If I could uh, you know, get, get my team members to flash the key areas of cooperation, that'd be great. So that uh, we all understand uh, what are the uh, impact that we can potentially work on I think one of the distinguished members of the panel talked about uh, very, uh, some of the topics are so theoretical and we've not implemented anything, you know, uh, we should more less superficial, more action oriented. So for us, when we launch something, we are entrepreneurs, uh, we are technopreneurs, we, we tend to, um, you know, walk the talk and, and pursue things in, in the fastest way possible. This event itself was brought together because of an idea that took place four weeks ago and got implemented four weeks later. And in the closing speech later on, you'll understand the struggle, the challenge, and the, the light at the end of the tunnel that comes into it because we believe in walking the talk. Now, in order, uh, I, I've sat through most, if not all of the tracks and sessions. Uh, how many tracks and sessions are there altogether? What, 40 something sessions in over five days by 94 speakers. So can you imagine I sat live in most, if not all of them. and some of the things that I gathered uh, from the panelists and from the audience is that a large part of them, uh, for, at least from the audience, are, are still unaware. They're still not aware of the full potential of AI. 
they do not know the definition of AI. And these are all senior decision makers too, amongst the crowd, right? They are policy makers, bankers, private sectors, VCs, PEs, and so on. So we find that we cannot ignore the first point, which is the promoting, educating, raising awareness on the topic of AI. And this is where the perception of AI being just theoretical and you know, philosophical comes into play. Because unfortunately, at least 70% of the audience are still not clear about the applications of AI. Um, and, 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 and it's not just restricted to one country, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, throughout the country. And this is not, even though surveys indicate that they are still big, you know, more interested, but they still do not know many things about what AI can do. And even just inviting them for the event, they think that this is full of technologies and techies, talking programming, Python, mm -hmm. SAS, and so on. But you notice a lot of speakers that we invited are more of them are practitioners, advisors, adopters, multipliers who spread the message of AI. And they themselves give feedback about that. So point one cannot be neglected and it has to be continuous through the universities, through the you know, young uh, you know, millennials, all the way to the mature uh, individuals. And in regard of that, right, we definitely have to run certification training programs for those that are more astute, uh, what we call digital AI labs program. We have more than 200 over expert systems in our portfolio covering 10 industry groups in different stages of development from prototype, right, to beta testing to actual implementation. And about 30 to 40% of them have been commercialized. And, and this is a very constant rate that, that, that we see. So in other words, why the percentage is 30%, right? Because we don't rush people. We don't push people against their will, against their resources, against their capacity to actually absorb AI, right? So I think it's very important uh, to educate them, but at the same time, we must be aware of the limitations of the human capacity to keep up with the rapid pace of technology. So here we talk about this psychological side. So as much as we want action, we cannot force the action into humans because there will be a lot of resistance and re repercussions and reactions to that. And we don't want people to get turned off by AI, right? So I think it's very important for us then to have a thematic focus mm -hmm. to this partnership, which is on microfinance, which is very big in Bangladesh, capital markets, your stock exchange, right? Uh, SME development that covers many, you know, uh, multiple sectors, so to speak. And then, of course, any industry clusters that you want, you talk about green tech, you talk about, uh, what do you call that? Uh, manufacturing tech or professional service tech. I mean, we are more than happy to create solutions around it and work with partners in Bangladesh. So, uh, and we just talk, talk about Bangladesh. We're talking about our partners in Africa, for example. We we'll want to look for talents. We want to look for capacity technology. As long as there's a commitment to transfer, transfer the knowledge to them. Every country wants to have that knowledge transfer. They don't want just to buy from you, they just want to get from you. They want to have the sustainable uh, you know, knowledge transfer to them so that they themselves can uh, promote and propagate uh, the skill set that they acquire from you. And this is our business model. This is what DAL is all about. This is what certification is dreaming about. We want to pass down the knowledge, democratize, and not just pass down knowledge, learn from you too. And then we spread it across many countries. And this is currently what we are doing with universities. Uh, locally, regionally, as well as globally. And of course, uh, we will spend time with the private sector players uh, to see how we can get developmental grants, sponsorship, and commercialize it with a proper business model. Like I said, we are entrepreneurs, but we are not ignorant of the triple bottom line. Okay, so we are very clear about uh, what is CSR, what is commercial, and how to blend both together. In fact, through this AI World Summit, if you listen back to the recordings, right, you, you can learn so much from subject matter experts that talk about all these SDGs and how corporates can conduct their own CSR activities better, right? And of course, these are not done with the snap of a finger. Uh, this is what we mean by walking the talk, right? So both parties need to understand the resources needed to execute uh, these uh, activities. It, it won't happen overnight. Uh, we will have a proper roadmap where we have outreach, marketing, operations, and the non-technical aspects. That is very important. The tech cannot be dictating how we should do things, right? It's the uh, thinking behind it, the business, the social economics, uh, and, and the operational aspects of it that we need to uh, take care of. 
So we are very practical people, as do you, uh, as to all the members here in this panel. And we hope that uh, through this uh, partnership with M M MFCG, right? Um, MCFG, sorry. Um, we are able to uh, form that little connection first before it gets uh, wider, bigger and deeper. So uh, this is my uh, sincere intention on behalf of my team also uh, to, to, to make this partnership work. Um, we spent a lot of time behind the scenes, right guys? Uh, on, on WhatsApp, on Zoom and uh, you know, uh, brainstorming ideas uh, in weird hours of the night. So I appreciate your efforts in making this work. Uh, I would like to pass over to you to say a few words too before uh, you and my co-partner actually uh, proceed to sign the MOU. Over to you, Maimon. Thank you very much. Uh, Nasri, I think uh, you explained it very, very well. Um, and although this wasn't pre-planned, a lot of the topics that came up in uh, today's discussion, I think it just goes to show that there is demand for what we want to you know, provide in Bangladesh. Uh, it's synergistic. It's not uh, only a one-way street where uh, MCFG or uh, MyFinB benefits, but it's something that can help the country as a whole. And I believe that uh, with the expertise that you do bring in and with our local connectivity, and I, I believe you can actually uh, create change and change the ecosystem together. Uh, we hold the license to Global Chamber uh, in uh, Dhaka and Barisal in the same way you do to uh, Singapore, as well as uh, I believe in Malaysia. And I, I think it's, it's the same uh, you know, drive that we want to go and see that we, we grow up together as a community as opposed to a single entity as an organization. There should be a business drive to it, but also there should be uh, social goals to it as well. Um, I, I think that we have the right framework put in place by the Bangladesh government. Uh, I believe a lot of things will change too. And as you said, if you can pull off an international event in uh, four weeks, um, I'm sure we can you know, be adaptive to those changes together. So I'm looking forward to some work, some amazing work with you and your team. And uh, let's get it started. Uh, that's the best way, I guess, to uh, go forward. So okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Maimon. Over to you, MC. Thank you. May I now invite Mr. Maimon Yuar Rashid Mustafa, Executive Director, Global Chamber at Dhaka, and CEO, Co founder of Momentum Consultancy and Facilitation Group, MCFG, to please sign the MOU. Next, my, may I invite Zygo Slum, co-founder, CFO, and head of NLG for my FIMB Holdings to please sign the MOU. Thank you. May I now invite both of the signatory to please show the signed MOU for picture taking. Ready? One, two, three. And one more. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, speakers, moderators, and the attendees for joining this final session and observing the signing MOU between MyFinB and Movement Consultancy Facilitation Group. <laughs>